Good morning. I am Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, the chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. <clears throat> Thank you for attending today's hearing. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all the new council members of the committee and look forward to working um, over the next four years together. Uh, today we will be discussing a package of bills aimed to mitigate the impact that rats have on the residents of NYC. Uh, nearly all New Yorkers have sighted rats in school playgrounds, parks, community gardens, subway stations, construction sites, and sidewalks. But we know that some communities are more affected than others. Uh, examining the way that we dispose of garbage and food waste in particular is of particular concern. The package includes eight bills. Proposed uh, intro number 203A, sponsored by Councilmember Matteo. Uh, local law to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to increasing penalties for littering. Uh, another pre-considered intro with no number yet, sponsored by Councilmember Miller. Uh, local law to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to unlawful dumping and the improper placement of discarded material. Another pre-considered intro by Councilmember Chin, a local law to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the cleaning of liquid generated by trash placed curbside for collection. Uh, another pre-considered uh, intro by Councilmember Chin um, would amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to rat mitigation zones. Another intro uh, sponsored by Councilmember Cumbo, a law that would, uh, uh, in relation to organic waste requirements applicable to food service establishment, establishments, food manufacturers, and food wholesalers in rat mitigation zones, and another sponsored by public advocate Tish James, um, a law uh, in relation to abating rodents as a requirement for the issuance of certain construction permits. Uh, another intro by, um, by me, a law that would uh, uh, <laughs> amend the administrative code uh, in the city of New York in relation to rat mitigation progress in rat mitigation zones. Um, and the last one, another bill by Mario, um, in relation to evidence of all unlawful dumping. It's a lot of bills related to rats. Uh, I look forward to hearing testimony from the administration about their current work on rat mitigation and their thoughts on these bills to control ordinance in New York City. I also anticipate valuable feedback from advocates and members of the public and would like to remind everyone that we will accept testimony for three days after this hearing. Uh, I will now turn it over uh, to any of the sponsors who wish to make opening statements here, um, and as seeing none, I'll turn it over uh, to uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Sanitation, D. Catherine Garcia. I'm actually going to let my colleague from the Health Department do the deep dive first, and then I will, I will take over. Um, okay, and we're just uh, going to, yes, we're going to swear you in, so go ahead. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Reynoso and members of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I'm Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Bassett, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Mayor's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative. In July 2017, Mayor de Blasio announced a $32 million multi-agency effort to reduce the rat population in neighborhoods with the highest burden of rat activity. The initiative builds on decades of rat control work at the health department and relies on evidence-based practices to target the most infested areas of the city. Rats thrive when they have ready access to food and water, a place to live, and effective transportation routes. That means that reducing the rat population requires managing garbage, eliminating nesting areas, and repairing cracks and holes in sidewalks and buildings. Safe, targeted baiting is the final piece of an effective integrated pest management program known as IPM. Rats do not observe the property lines we've created or distinguish between public and private ownership, nor do they operate during business hours. We all know that rats come out at night. To be successful then, everyone in a neighborhood must work together across our usual boundaries and in times and places that matter most to rats. The department's approach to rat control is multi-pronged and data-driven. In our rat indexing program, inspectors walk block by block to check every property for signs of rats and conditions conducive to rats. We also inspect properties in response to complaints. When rat signs or rat conditions are observed, property owners receive commissioner's orders requiring them to remediate, and if they fail to comply, are issued violations subject to fines. Our licensed pest management professionals conduct ex ex exterminations 
and in our Rodent Academy, we offer free classes for property owners and managers to learn IPM techniques. We publish guidance materials in multiple languages on rat reduction and prevention, and we make inspection results available online on the Rat Information Portal. Our inspection data enables the department to analyze which neighborhoods in the city carry the heaviest rat burdens. Using those data and knowing that successfully combating rats requires collaboration, in 2015, the department dramatically expanded its pilot rat reservoir program to bring enhanced rat control to 45 communities across the city. A rat reservoir is an area that provides an ideal ecosystem for rats. Even if a significant number of rats are eliminated, the rat population is quickly replenished, making long-lasting reduction especially challenging. In each rat reservoir, our inspector conducts a detailed block-by-block -block survey of rat activity and conditions that can support rats, and a case manager trains building managers in IPM, works with business improvement districts to address litter and activate neighborhood businesses, works with sister agencies to address issues on private property, and provides technical assistance to property owners ordered to remediate. Where a property owner fails to comply with a commissioner's order to conduct baiting, the department's pest management professionals will conduct those exterminations and bill the owner for the work. The Rat Reservoir Program has had excellent results. In just over two years, 10 of the 45 rat reservoirs, more than 20%, launched in 2015 have graduated and we've achieved an 80% reduction of rat signs and conditions conducive to rats in 15 of the parks within the rat reservoirs. We continue to monitor areas that have been graduated to ensure that reductions in rat activity are maintained. We know that some areas of the city, though, need even more intensive support to address the underlying structural and behavioral conditions that support high rat populations. In July of 2017, the city launched the Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative, which expanded the areas of focus around 15 reservoirs located in core areas of the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Lower Manhattan. These three areas, the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, Bushwick and Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, and the East Village, Lower East Side, and Chinatown in Manhattan have higher rates of rat activity than other areas of the city. The Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative includes a renewed focus on reducing rat activity within NYCHA developments around schools and in parks in these designated areas and has a broad focus on reducing rats' access to food. The Mayor's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative brings together multiple city agencies to provide that concentrated effort. This portfolio of work includes improving garbage management through increased pickups, placement of rat-proof and rat-resistant waste containers in parks and on sidewalks, placing new trash compactors in NYCHA developments, and improving school garbage management. Under the initiative, a stoppage team is repairing cracks and holes to make it harder for rats to emerge above ground, and concrete rat pads will cover dirt basement floors in NYCHA to eliminate nesting areas. Multi-agency inspections in buildings with significant rat activity are holding private property owners accountable, and targeted exterminations in parks and other city-owned infrastructure will help eliminate rats. We were excited to announce just yesterday that the health department is launching dry ice extermination in parks, a method that promises to be extremely effective at killing rats quickly and painlessly, while also avoiding secondary effects on wildlife such as hawks. We are confident that this comprehensive effort to address neighborhoods burdened by high rat activity will achieve long-term improvements. But we can only truly succeed if everyone works together. The suite of legislation to be introduced will support key parts of the program and is fundamental to its success. We want to thank the Council for being a critical partner in this exciting initiative. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I would be happy to take questions. Commissioner Garcia will first address the legislation under consideration today. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. And welcome back from Paternity Week. Uh, I am Catherine Garcia, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation, and I'm thrilled to have a lot of new committee members. I think we'll be able to do some exciting things over the next four years. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the city's efforts to fight rats through the Mayor's Neighborhood Rat Reduction Initiative, including the package of bills under consideration today. As Deputy Commissioner Schiff laid out, this initiative targets three areas of the city with the highest prevalence of rat activity, including the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, Chinatown, East Village, Lower East Side in Manhattan, and Bushwick, Bedford, Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. This interagency initiative aims to reduce rat activity by up to 70% in the targeted zones 
by minimizing food sources and available habitats. DSNY is proud to join with our sister agencies to step up the fight against rats in New York City. I think this may be one thing all New Yorkers agree on, is the dislike of rats. Uh, this approach is unique because we are focused not only eliminating rats through extermination, which the health department and other agencies will continue to do, but we are also deploying a broad set of strategies to eliminate conditions that allow rats to thrive. The best way to eliminate rats is to deprive them of food, including garbage in homes and litter on New York City streets. To this end, earlier this month, DSNY completed replacing all remaining open wire mesh litter baskets in these zones with rat-resistant steel cans or compacting solar trash cans, which should meaningfully reduce rats' access to food sources compared to the current wire baskets. DSNY has also increased litter basket service and residential service in the most critical areas within the targeted areas. Additionally, DSNY is part of a multi-agency initiative that is targeting private buildings alongside DOHMH, Department of Buildings, and HPD to identify conditions that contribute to rat infestation, order owners to make repairs and issue violations when warranted. DSNY, DOHMH, and the Mayor's Office have also worked to develop comprehensive strategies to reduce rodent activity on city property in partnership with the Parks Department, the Department of Education, and the New York Housing Authority. In addition, DSNY is focused on outreach and enforcement to promote waste management best practices, including separating organic waste. Just yesterday, we launched our first Bronx cohort of large apartment buildings participating in organics collection, including more than 150 buildings in the Bronx rat mitigation zone. The proposed legislation considered by the committee today will help the city achieve these goals and will promote a healthier, safer, cleaner New York for all. I would like to briefly discuss the legislation under consideration by the committee today. The first piece of legislation sponsored by the chair amends Title 17 of the Administrative Code to require the Health Department to submit an annual report on the progress of rot miti rodent mitigation in rat mitigation zones designated by the Health Department. The administration supports this proposal and looks forward to working with the council to identify the appropriate timing and content for such reports. Council Member Chin has sponsored le legislation that would amend Section 16-120 of the Administrative Code to require buildings with nine or more dwelling units located in any rat mitigation zone to place their refuse and recyclables out for DSNY collection after 4 a.m. on the scheduled day of pickup. Currently, DSNY rules allow refuse and recycling to be placed out for collection no earlier than 4 p.m. the day prior to collection. However, this means that waste can be set out for more than 12 hours overnight, exposed to the elements and offering a plentiful food source to rats. As Deputy Commissioner Schiff mentioned, rats are most active at night. The department supports this bill, which would greatly reduce the time that garbage is placed out for collection on city sidewalks and reduce access to one of the greatest food sources for rats in the identified districts. The third piece of legislation sponsored by Council Member Cumbo requires all food service establishments, food manufacturers, and food wholesalers located in a rat mitigation zone, regardless of square footage, to source, separate, and recycle organic waste in accordance with DSNY's rules relating to the recycling of commercial organic waste. This would be in addition to those entities already designated by rule pursuant to Local Law 146 of 2013. Such requirements include that all organic waste be placed in containers that have a lid and latch, lock or other fastening or sealing mechanism or cord that keeps the lids closed and is resistant to tampering by rodents or other wildlife. The department supports this bill. The next piece of legislation, intro, intro 203A, would increase the fines for repeat violators of the city's littering law found in section 16-1181A of the Administrative Code. This Councilmember Matteo sponsored legislation would increase the minimum penalties for a second, third, and subsequent offense within a 12-month period. While DSNY supports the intent of this legislation to increase penalties for persistent litterers, unfortunately, such repeat violations are difficult for our agents and officers to issue and personally serve. 
The department looks forward to working with the city council to improve the efficacy of our littering law. The next bill under consideration by the committee today, also sponsored by Council Member Chin, would require food service establishments to hose down the sidewalks and curbs when liquids leak onto the sidewalks from waste that has been collected. The law currently requires that commercial establishments clean the sidewalk and the area extending 18 inches into the street of all debris at two designated times during the day. Additionally, DSNY can issue violations for spillage conditions at any time, i.e. when the garbage is sort of strewn around on the sidewalk. However, this legislation would place an affirmative requirement on the food establishment to clean the sidewalk in accordance with the parameters set forth in the legislation. The administration looks forward to working with City Council to ensure that our sidewalks remain clean without causing any issues with our sewer system. Public Advocate James is the sponsor of the next bill under consideration today, which, which provides that no new building or alteration permit shall be issued or renewed for a site located in a rat mitigation zone designated by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene unless the applicant demonstrates to the Department of Building that rodent abatement measures acceptable to the Health Department have been taken at such site. While demolition companies are already required to hire licensed exterminators to perform pre-demolition extermination, the administration is open to working with the council and our public advocate to address the issues related to rat activity in and around construction sites. Now we will turn to the topic of illegal dumping and improper disposal, which are important topics for DSNY. Section 16-119 of the Administrative Code currently prohibits any person to dump any amount of material that is transported in a motor vehicle to be dumped in any public or privately owned area. Over the past few years, DSNY enforcement personnel have observed an increase in the incidence of illegal dumping throughout the city. In order for DSNY to issue a violation, DSNY must actually observe the material being unloaded from a dump truck or other vehicle being illegally dumped. DSNY believes that increasing the criminal and civil penalties imposed for the act of illegal dumping will significantly help deter this unscrupulous activity by individuals wishing to avoid payment of proper disposal costs for their unwanted material. In addition, under Section 16-120E of the Administrative Code, DSNY has the authority to issue summonses <coughs> to persons who dispose of their household or commercial refuse in public litter baskets. This provision also contains a rebutable presumption that any name or other identifying information indicated among the contents improperly disposed of is of the person responsible for the unlawful placing of such material in the public receptacle. This allows DSNY to issue violations to such persons without having to directly observe the violation occurring. However, DSNY can currently only issue these violations when a person improperly disposes of his or her refuse directly into the litter basket, but not the area surrounding or alongside the litter basket. The expansion of the rebuttable presumption to cover household or com commercial refuse improperly placed in other publicly or privately owned areas will give DSNY another important tool to combat this quality of life issue. This piece of legislation will enhance DSNY's goal of curbing illegal dumping and improper disposal in New York City, as well as reduce the potential food sources for rats. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My colleagues and I will now be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Cambrera, Councilmember Deutsch, and uh, the public advocate, Letitia James. Um, ask a couple of questions and then allow for my colleagues to, to ask questions. Um, um, is the city concerned that this will push rats to neighborhoods just outside the mitigation zone? Is that a concern? I mean, I'm certain that the health department will be watching that, but the whole idea here is that we are going to get rid of them, not send them to a new neighborhood. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, that okay. sounds good. Um, I don't know anything more iconic than like the New York City rat outside of like the Statue of Liberty. Um, those are just things that that's just things we things we know. But um, it's not because we like them that they right. that that we know that that they're New York, but they are very New York. Um, is the city on target to meet its goal of a seventy percent reduction of rat activity by the end of twenty eighteen in the three areas identified in the mayor's thirty two million dollar rat mitigation plan? I mean, we, we have just really begun this work, so we are tracking all of the metrics, so we feel that we are on target. 
uh, to really push that number down to the 70%. And as you heard before, uh, the health department has been very successful when they have done targeted work in rat reservoirs of graduating them out of the program. So we are hopeful that we can graduate these neighborhoods out of the program. Okay, and just some... And we will be reporting yeah. to you. Yes, we the reporting document will let us know if we're making any progress on that. I think that's very important, that we don't need to wait for committee hearings to know the progress that we're making in those zones, so I'm excited about that. I would encourage you, if you really want to go deep on rats, is the health department has a whole web portal with maps, and you can drill down to your block and your neighborhood and find out how many buildings have failed their inspections um, or commercial establishments. Like restaurants? Like restaurants. Okay. Um, it's like, I'm like, oh, maybe that's why the restaurant not too far from my house closed recently. Um, so y there's a lot of information there that I think, you know, just have time on your hands. Okay. Well, from my own personal experience, being having a couple of buildings in the rat mitigation zone as well, or I, I want to say the... Um, the plan that was put forth uh, about like six months ago, I want to say? I think it was uh, in July. I'm not, I don't okay. totally remember, but I feel like it was summertime. There's been great progress in Highland houses and Bushwick houses when it comes to how we've addressed those issues. So if, um, if that is being expanded anywhere, I, I, I think the New York City is going to be very happy um, with how we are, we're addressing this rat issue. I just have a couple more questions because I really want to allow for my colleagues to, to ask some questions. Um, how will the public be educated about rat mitigation measures that they can take? Um, is there going to be a public education campaign? Uh, so beyond the rat academy that the health department holds on a regular basis across the city, which is in high demand, uh, they are doing an advertising campaign in those districts to help educate people. And of course, if some of this legislation passed, there'll be additional outreach to tell people about what their responsibilities are. So can we expand on that? A lot of folks don't know what the, the the rat academy is. You don't you don't come out a rat from the academy. So um, I, I'm going to let the health department answer okay, exactly what is in the rat academy. Okay. Uh, sure. Thank you for that question. Um, we know you've been a supporter of the rat academy. I've taken it myself. It's really a terrific class. We offer them uh, at least monthly, sometimes more than mo more than monthly. We're we're very interested in working with council members to sponsor them in your district. Um, they're free. They are for property managers, and they really teach the, the ins and outs of uh, integrated pest management and how to properly manage trash. Um, we also hold them for, for tenant leaders. Um, so we'd be happy to follow up with you to, to um, sponsor additional RAD academies in, in any of your council districts. The first one I saw was in Chinatown when I went to Chinatown to see it, and it was unbelievable. It was, it was packed in there. I didn't think people would be that interested, but obviously they are. Um, so now I just want to allow for my colleagues to ask some questions. want to actually first acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Rafael Espinal and also uh, want to know if the public advocate had a statement to make given that she is a sponsor of one of the pieces of legislation. I'll just refer to the record. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, public advocate. So allow for Councilmember Cabrera from the Bronx. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much that you only ask two questions and allow us to come in early. Really appreciate it. Shows the leadership. Uh, so, this uh, is the fun committee. I, I that's why I'm, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> um, Commissioner, I was a, a little curious as to your response when the when <laughs> uh, when the chair asked you uh, the fear that we have that if rats don't find food uh, and because of the great work that you're doing in a particular area that we hope they don't move to another area. But reality is, well, you know, just like it was mentioned earlier, uh, that they're looking for water, they're looking for food. And so they're going to look someplace else, just like humans. Uh, so how, how do we track that? Is there a way to track if there's movement, uh, do you have, do you have like a tracker that shows increased activity in certain areas, a result of your efforts in another area? I'm going to let the health department answer that because I mean I actually think that the, what they're doing on tracking and indexing and how very data focused they are um, would actually allow you to see if we thought that there was something changing radically across a, a district line. That's good. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes, we so we, we have a lot of data collection. We also just want to make make sure that everyone's aware that it, you know in addition to the to the zones, we that doesn't mean we abandon the rest of our work. The department conducts you know 100,000 rat inspections every year. We do indexing. We've done indexing in a substantial percentage of the city. So the the mitigation zones, the the intense uh, work will happen there, but that doesn't mean that our work across the rest of the city will will stop. We respond to all 311 complaints about about rats, and we do um, very uh, we have a very robust data collection, and we will be monitoring exactly that. So we don't know yet, right? It's too early. We we don't think we don't think that um, a concentrated effort in these zones. So that as uh, Commissioner Garcia said, our goal is not to move rats. Our goal is to exterminate rats and, <coughs> and to eliminate the conditions that allow for rat activity. Now, one of the concerns that some of my constituents, especially homeowners, have expressed is that they no longer want to call in when they see an increased uh, population of rats due to let's say construction next to them because when uh, somebody shows up to, to take it and to see rats in their property, they end up getting uh, a fine. Is there any way that, you know, if, for example, if I were to call in and say, hey, I'm trying to be helpful here as a result of, you know, whenever there's a disturbance in a property that had been abandoned, rats start moving, and, uh, and I've seen it firsthand. Uh, we have uh, in Sedwick Avenue, I mean, just huge rats uh, that c come across property. So, as a matter of fact, a resident was telling me about it. I see was telling me about it. <laughs> you know, Mickey Mouse came by and said, hello, yes, we are here. So uh, is, there, is there a judgment call that is made when uh, the inspectors come in? So when our inspectors are out conducting the ins inspection, they are looking for signs of rat activity and also the conditions that are that are uh, creating that rat activity. Um, it might be maybe we can follow up with you about a rat academy. That might be you know as I said, um, it's really it's really has to be everyone in the community working together because that rat does not observe that property line. And right. so it, it may be that we should follow up and and consider holding a rat academy. Um, so that we can help the, the uh, community members in that area work together. Okay. I but I also want to add, is, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, when, when, an, when a health inspector goes out initially, they give you a warning, basically, and then you need to mitigate the problem. Gotcha. And it's only after you mitigate, that you fail to mitigate the problem that there's fines involved. Am I correct about that? That's right. Thanks for that clarification. Um, That's helpful. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, the other thing to think about is that in general, just from my deep education into the rat world now. Uh, you know, rats don't travel very far from where they're born. Hmm. So if we can sort of contain them and exterminate them, they don't tend to go off on large journeys, which is why I think even the New York Times found when they did the DNA coding of the rat populations, they were actually distinct, uh, and you could tell the difference between uptown and downtown. That's interesting. They don't actually usually tend to travel very, very far. Um, in their quest for food or water. Not that they can't, but they don't tend to. So I'm gonna close with this last question because I wanna follow the lead of the chair and not asking a lot of questions. Uh, and that is uh, in regards to technology, if there's new technology uh, that you see in the horizon that uh, you see in other municipalities or around the world, uh, have we considered breeding more hawks? Is that something that uh, parks department perhaps uh, had looked at something creative because they love to eat rats. Um, is, is that is so I mean I can defer to the health department but the the city as a whole is really focused on anything that anyone is doing which is where uh, using the carbon dioxide the dry ice as an extermination technique came from um, both experiments here and in Chicago that were very, very effective. And in part, they're very effective because they don't kill the hawk. Because mm. um, when you use straight poisons, if they eat a rat, then they end up dying as well. And hawks are great predators. Yes. And they are um, expanding in their habitat in New York City. But we can have the Parks Department follow up with you on their population estimates. But the thing that's true about rats, which has been true about rats for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's, it's about basic sanitation. If you get rid of the food and the water and the ability for them to burrow, their ability to um, 
uh, feel safe. I mean, one of the reasons they crawl along buildings is they don't, they, they're they designed to know that there could be a threat from the air. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you remove those uh, opportunities, you can get real control. Gotcha. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the work that you do. Mr. Chair, thank you for the time. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. Now over to Councilmember Heindeutsch from Brooklyn. Thank you, yes. We don't it's have rats in Brooklyn. The best borough, yeah. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming, and this is really um, uh, a very important hearing where we're all joining forces. So I know when it comes to the rat population, you know, the last time I tried to kill a rat with a, with a ratchet, it didn't work. So, um, so I'm glad we're all getting together. So the question here is for the commissioner. Uh, how many districts uh, throughout uh, New York City currently have uh, organics collection? Um, I believe we are at 22 districts that currently have organics collection. <coughs> um, and so for in the areas that are uh, the focus of these particular um, designations by the health department, many of them are not in curbside areas yet, which is why I flagged that uh, one of the areas of the Bronx that's focused on this is where we've actually had buildings voluntarily join the program. And um, so how many, how many trucks were redirected um, from regular trash pickup or recycling uh, to pick up organics? Um, so it depends on what the district is that you are in, in your district, almost none, because we have changed how we are doing your collections. Uh, and so on one day of the week, you are picked up by the rear loader as you were before, and on the second portion of the week, it's a split body, so half refuse, half organics. But we can get you a full documentation of all of the numbers and where we are in terms of that program. So you're saying all the trucks, and did you have to bring in additional trucks, or? In certain neighborhoods where we are using both rear loaders, we, are, we have additional trucks. Uh, in some areas, we reduce the refuse number and balance that against the organics number. But it really is uh, district by district, and the approach is different for each one, depending on how much refuse they produce. So those organic trucks that um, you're saying you we didn't eliminate any trucks. So those organic trucks, they are picking up organics that usually pick up recycling. So those are, are the same trucks so they're using. So, so you don't have any additional trucks that you brought in just for organics. So in certain districts, there are more trucks that are for organics. It depends on what the approach was in terms of how we are rolling out the program. And it varies in different districts. But we'd be happy to sit down with you and have an in-depth conversation about exactly where we were and where there are more trucks or less trucks uh, so that we can make sure that you have a detailed understanding of that. Okay. Do you anticipate uh, for this uh, year's fiscal year to purchase new uh, mechanical equipment? Um, oh, we will definitely be purchasing new mechanical equipment because we actually worked very hard with the last committee uh, to ensure that we had a steady buy of both rear loader and dual bin uh, equipment. So. At this point, we feel really good about where we are in terms of the fleet numbers. Um, it was one thing that took us a long time to get resolved with OMB and the committee, and, and we're really uh, pretty happy about where we are at the moment. Okay, the city, um, you did, they did mention in the testimony that the city spent uh, $32 million to reduce rat pop the rat population in 2017. Um, so. I know that um, when, when we talk about trash collection on the holidays, like for example, the holidays come out on a Monday. So if someone has uh, trash collection on a Monday, then they have to keep it out until the following week. And if someone has recycling on a Monday, then you have to keep it in until uh, the following week. But if there's a holiday, two Mondays, <coughs> two, two consecutive uh, weeks, then you have to wait more than two weeks. So, so uh, there, there's some specific issues about Monday, Monday holidays. So on Mondays, uh, if you, our collection is on Monday and Thursday, because if your collection is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, it's going to be different. Um, but if you are a buy on Monday, Thursday, which I am, uh, you put your, re your refuse or your recycling out, uh, with the refuse out after 4 o'clock, and we attempt to get as much of it as we can with the staff that we have. We do not have the ability with our current staffing 
to do 100% of all of Monday and all of Tuesday on Tuesday. We just don't have enough people. Um, if it is double-backed holidays on Mondays for recycling, on the second recycling, we always go after that first since they haven't had a collection to make sure that we get it. Um, but in terms of if you're Monday, Thursday, and we miss you on the Tuesday, we'll get you on the Thursday. If you're uh, in a rat district, you're usually Monday, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So you, if it's a Monday holiday, you're getting picked up the next day anyway. Um, that is the additional collection. And in terms of the amount of funding that was provided uh, for this particular endeavor, it's about uh, $3 million for the Department of Sanitation. The additional money is primarily for the New York Housing Authority for capital construction work that they need to do to make it so that they can mitigate the rat challenges. And then, of course, uh, additional funding for the health department for inspectors. And then for the parks department for additional collections to ensure we're not having overflowing litter baskets in parks. And obviously, the investment in the steel cans and the um, uh, big belly baskets. So I personally, I have Monday collection. I have Monday collection. Yes. So I. Um, the uh, Department of Sanitation tells me to put out the trash if the holiday falls on the Monday, which it does. On 4 uh, To put it out after 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. If you place it out 4 o'clock, mm -hmm. it does not get picked up the following day. It does. So it about, we usually get to about 70% so of the population. So 70% yeah. gets picked up. Mm -hmm. I was part of the 30% that didn't get picked up. So you have the entire neighborhood, the trash is sitting outside. Um, that's regular trash. Mm -hmm. uh, that's if they get to it, and that's if there's you don't have a snowstorm in between. So if you have a snowstorm, it stays out even longer. So that's with the regular trash. Now the recycling, uh, people have no room to keep the recycling in their house. So they do place it outside and do not, they do not get is, uh, issued summonses. Because, no, we don't issue Yeah, them. they don't issue summonses. So now you have the recycling outside on a Monday. Uh, then it sits out and then there's another holiday the following Monday. So it sits down even longer. So now you have we, the we, 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 we chase all of the all of so the second no, recycling. Second, hold on. So you have now the trash sitting outside, you have the recycling sitting outside. So we need to figure out how to close that gap um, by letting us know how much funding is needed because you are spending thirty-two million dollars, thirty-two million. So if you take some of that, some of that thirty-two million and put it into sanitation for um, mechanical equipment, for manpower, and making sure that that trash, that Monday's trash that you're placing after 4 o'clock gets picked up the following day, that the Monday's recycling you're putting out, sh you shouldn't have to wait the following week. It should be picked up right away. So we need to figure out um, how we can work together uh, to make sure that the Department of Sanitation has the proper funding for mechanical equipment, for manpower, to make sure that our trash does not um, be le our trash is not left out, and it gets picked up in a, a in a proper in a proper fashion. No, we're, we're, we're going fashion. to we're we're happy to we're going to provide but, but every, you with that every, budget number. Yeah, but every year every year we're sitting here and we're talking about it, but people are furious. You know, this is the bread and butter of our quality of life, is our trash being picked up. You know, we're discussing different initiatives throughout the council, throughout the administration, about doing different things. This is, this is, this affects all of our quality of lives. And if you don't have a, a rat area, right, this is just prone to that. You have rats, you have raccoons, you have possums, they're all in my backyard. Um, and so it's not just rats. And when the trash sits outside, you know, it just defeats the whole purpose of, of the hearings that we're sitting here today talking about, you know, issuing summonses and giving people additional summonses and hiring the fines. But we as the city, we must do our part first, set an example, and then we could say, okay, now you got to do your part. But we need to figure out a way this fiscal year, this budget season, to figure out how we can close the gap. And this is something that I'm going to be pushing really hard with our chair but we need to figure out, we need to know a number of how much money, because I know in 2009, the funding for sanitation was reduced, and we never put it back. 
So we need to make sure that that funding is put back. We have enough mechanical equipment for, for the organics, for the trash, for the recycling, for um, picking up for the overtime. Our men and women of the sanitation, you know I am one of the biggest supporters. I have uh, personally, our, my district has funded uh, for uh, four mechanical equipment, um, uh, two salt spreaders and two uh, street sweepers for sanitation. I'll do anything uh, for our men and women of the Department of, San of Sanitation. But we need to work together. We need to close this gap. It must be done. Uh, we cannot wait another year. So, so thank you. And we, we will provide the number. Um, it's going to be a lot because uh, you're asking me to surge staff. Uh, and so, therefore, we will provide that number to the council and to your and to make sure that you know what it is. Um, and then it'll be a question of whether or not this stays the priority for the council and, and for the administration. Thank you. And we could we could dive deeper into those concerns during our budget hearing as well. Um, I think uh, that's next week. Next week. So there you go. Next week we'll be we'll be we'll be getting that number hopefully. Um, yeah, we'll to see how we can address those issues. And, and just um, to follow up, even though, you know, I just want to get back to the rats. Um, the, in the Heim Deutsches district, mm -hmm. in front of his house, mm -hmm. trash gets picked up once a week? Is it no, no, Monday, Thursday. He's a Monday, Thursday. With so he Monday leaves it out Monday, week. it gets picked up Thursday? It gets picked up Tuesday. And then he puts out Wednesday. No, he, on Monday, he puts out Sunday, he gets picked up Monday. Puts out Wednesday, he gets picked up Thursday. But when it's a holiday and they're so in this particular winter, which is not actually common, Christmas, New Year's, Lincoln, and presidents were all on Mondays. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously Martin Luther King. But Christmas, New Year's, and Lincoln's are usually actually often not on a Monday. They shift around to other days of the week. Um, so there was a particular Monday's had, you know, a lot of misses. But if it didn't get picked up Monday, it got picked up Thursday. Right. You would always get picked up Thursday as long as it didn't snow. But usually what we do is if you put it out on the holiday, on Monday, we will put people on overtime as many as we can beyond our regular shift to try and get as much of the Monday material as well as getting the Tuesday. Um, but you know, the reason why is we didn't have enough people to actually reach – a hundred percent of all of the routes and so that is why he did not get collected we try and move around who's the who's the 70 percent who's the 30 percent in different sections so that not everyone ends up in that situation all the time um, and then it is different in the areas that are the tri areas because usually we're just going to come on the Wednesday um, and not try and get the Tuesday and then the Wednesday well, okay so I know because he mentioned waiting a whole week so time. on recycling, if you are a Monday recycling, you, we will not chase the recycling the first time. If there are two holidays in a row, we will chase the second time. We will go after it and chase it the second time. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, now back to the uh, the uh, the rat issue. So the violations are currently issued annually for unlawful dumping. Do we know how many violations are issued? Oh, for illegal dumping or for yeah, hold on. That's for the illegal dumping, yes. Uh, yeah, so this year for um, the operator of a vehicle, we've issued 83. For the owner, we've issued 57. Um, and then one person, you can submit an affidavit as a member of the public if you see it. And so one person has submitted an affidavit and we've written the ticket off their affidavit. And then... Is it effective at the moment? Um, yeah, I'm hearing uh, the so complaints I, that I get about public dumping, uh, not necessarily from my district, but citywide, are a lot, um, or everyone's yeah. talking about it, and the numbers that you have. So illegal dumping is a very technical, specific part, portion of the statute. It requires you to be using a motor vehicle, and it requires us to see you using the motor vehicle do the dumping. So it's a hard ticket to write. Um, and or to have someone write an affidavit saying they saw this car used to dump material. Um, improper disposal is when someone takes their household waste and sets it next to a litter basket or a street vendor sets all their material next to a litter basket. Um, I need to see you do that right now. 
um, in order to write those tickets. So it happens a lot, and it's sort of, it's sort of like speeding. Uh, people think that they're not going to get caught. Uh, the reason that we want to make the change is if you have, like, your mail in there or something in there or a box in there that has the address, we can then write the ticket to that address. So we don't have to physically see the actual violation occur. It's presumed that it's yours if all of your refuse is in that bag. All right, that's good to, that's good to know. I want to allow for um, Council Member... Uh, Margaret Chin, who also is a sponsor of one of the bills um, that we're discussing today. So, Council Member Chin. Actually, two of the bills. Two of the bills, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, good morning. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Chair Renoso, for holding this very important hearing on rat mitigation. New York City may have some of the most fearless rodents in the country. You know, online videos of rats running on the subway platforms or grabbing a quick bite might be a good click bite. However, when rats are able to find sustainable homes in our parks and in our streets, they become a serious hazard to our health and quality of life, especially in largely mixed commercial and residential area, such as Lower Manhattan. It's alarming to see, to find families of rats finding a variety of dining options by scurrying from garbage piles to streaks of grease on sidewalks. Last year, I joined Mayor de Blasio to announce a pilot program to place high capacity big belly trash cans in areas with high number of rats. This is just one part of the solution to achieve lasting results. Our city, our businesses, building owners, and residents must all do their part to rid our city of rats. And that is why I've introduced legislation to require buildings within a rat mitigation zone that has nine units or more, which are required to have a super, to only take out its garbage between the hours of 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. I also introduced legislation to require businesses in the spring and summer season to clean the grease and other garbage juice off of a sidewalk before they open. These simple solutions can deprive rats a further opportunity to freeload off our garbage. Once again, I wanted to thank Chair Renosos for hearing this important topic, and I also want to thank uh, Nicole Ambeni for her work in drafting these bills, and I look forward to uh, having conversation about how we can reduce the rat population. I know, everyone, um, nobody seems to be supporting the rats today. No. <laughs> no <laughs> but they do, I mean, like, the garbage piles up, because everyone brings out the garbage so early and most of the garbage are food garbage, mm -hmm. right? Until we get to this whole organic uh, we're you know, recycling. There, we're there. I mean, every garbage bag is full of food and it's just there for 10 hours or more every day. And so that's why we're trying to do this pilot mm -hmm. to see if we could limit it to early morning so that the garbage will only sit there for maybe a two hours before they get picked up. Yep. So hopefully that will help. Thank you. Can, can we like, go through the details of what that looks like, the two-hour pickup? Um, they set it out, and it should be picked up within two hours. No, no, the, the, it's, it's that it will be si it'll be picked up on the shift starting at 6 a.m. Um, and so it's just so that we limit, uh, so it's not out there for the 12 hours before 4 a.m. So instead of being out a minimum of 14 hours, we're now minimizing that to two. And partly this is really based off what the health department tells us about when rats are happy and out there. Um, and so they're they're going to go have a midnight snack if they can. That's good to know. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Um, and I'd like to call on uh, Public Advocate Fish James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank your staff and the committee staff. And I also want to thank my colleagues and government city council members uh, for this comprehensive package. I will be brief because I've been all over the city from Brighton Beach to Prospect Heights to Upper East Side and Long Island City to Union Square and the... I hear stories about the rats gone wild. Um, and so obviously it's a major issue and I have personal experience. I'm sure you can recall as a former city council member representing the Atlantic Yards project when that was first um, undergoing construction, rats were all over downtown Brooklyn. Um, and we worked with the developer who provided um, the residents in my district all steel cans and he did uh, some rodent mitigation all throughout downtown Brooklyn as a result of uh, the rat infestation. 
but uh, research shows that in addition to the obvious issues that lead to rat infestations, one of the biggest causes of rat sighting complaints in our city, uh, again, based upon my experience, is the ongoing construction, demolitions, and renovations that are happening in our city. And when construction commences, the process often disturbs existing rat dens, and it leads to hundreds of rats at a time trying to locate to other existing structures. Uh, and so construction companies must be responsible for rat abatement before and during the construction pro process, ensuring that business homes and parks remain rat free so that residents can continue to live and work safely. Um, and so um, I recognize that uh, there has already been st steps taken by the city, but clearly that is not enough, which is why there's a package of legislation which has been proposed by the city council as well as myself, uh, will hopefully reduce uh, the rat population in our city. So let me just get to my questions. First of all, uh, for the Department of Health, is, rat, is uh, Rick Simeone here? He's not here. He's out combating rats. Okay. He is the rat expert in this city, and I hope everyone knows his name. Rex, uh, uh, Rick Simeone is an, the resident expert on rats. We have walked the streets in downtown Brooklyn each and every block. He has educated me about rats. Um, before we had rat academies, I was a student of Rick Simeone. Um, <laughs> and I can say I have more than enough certificates from Rick uh, and know all about a rodent infestation in the city of New York. And it disgusts me. Um, but he uh, certainly is an expert, and he should get all of the credit. So my first question, um, and that is, although I'm happy about the proposed target areas, my question is, is uh, when it, what, if, what is the possibility of expanding these targets, target areas to include Upper West Side, Fort Greene, the Rockaways, parts of the South Bronx, Prospect Heights, and the list goes on and on and on. When can we expand or um, the additional mitigation zones in the city of New York? Um, so I think that the way that the legislation is crafted uh, is it allows the health department to develop a set of rules in terms of looking at what the metrics are in each of those particular neighborhoods. Um, one of the things I would like to suggest, though, is in terms of the intensive uh, focus is let, you know, before we try and expand it to a new district, is it working in these? Have we got the right mix of uh, solutions? But I think that obviously the way that the legislation is crafted hopefully allows people to graduate out of their mitigation zone, but can also allow someone to be nominated to be in a rat mitigation zone. And that will go through uh, the rulemaking process, and so there'll be public input into exactly what uh, the health department should be considering beyond what they already are in terms of the indexing and the 311 complaints and their inspections uh, and all of the findings that they have about parks, buildings, the housing authority, anything else that they can seem to get their hands on in terms of data. And so how long will you, how long will this look back period be before you can expand the number of uh, zones? I don't think we have a specific time frame on it, and I think that we still need to go through the rulemaking process, and it might be something that we'd like to define within the rulemaking process. The one thing that is also true in this group of bills is that Chair Reynoso has specifically asked uh, around uh, making sure that it's documented who's moving in and out of mitigation zones as part of the reporting and as part of those metrics. One of the I live along the G line, and one of the issues um, is along MTA uh, lines. Um, and so rats uh, come up from the subway system uh, and unfortunately burrow into some of our urban gardens. Two questions, are we working in collaboration with the MTA? And two, what are we, uh, is there a rat uh, rodent reduction plan for our urban gardeners? So I mean, I think I'll speak to the urban garden for property that is either owned by the city, and I, I'm assuming you're talking about property that's owned by the, the, pocket, <coughs> the pocket gardens? Yes. Uh, yes. Those we are going to be working very closely with within the mitigation zones. They are already part of our thinking uh, in terms of making sure that they are not creating a place where there is appropriate habitat uh, for rats. Uh, in terms of the MTA, that's sort of an ongoing conversation around, I mean, I know that rats come out of the subway. I mean, yep. If you ask the Parks Department, their biggest challenges are yep. their parks that sit over subway stations. Yep. Um, but we are, we are working collaboratively with those to try and identify and make sure that uh, if there are rats within the subway system that 
they that stay there. They're, they're there. Trust okay, me. yes, but the floor, <laughs> they at least stay down on the tracks. Right. But I know that the pizza rat was very, was very, uh, it's yeah, not yeah, only I know, really, really. parks along the subway line, but there's also residences along the subway line. And in the evening when I come home, I'm oftentimes welcomed by uh, a family of rodents. I mean, so if there's a specific area you'd like us to look at, we can. I mean, in terms of uh, buildings, it's like rats don't go in, into the building unless there's a reason to go into the building, and no, the health they department crawl along can speak the wall. to the... They, they crawl along the wall of the, of the homes of the brownstones in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, right below, right near the A line, the C line, and the G line. It's a major issue, and, Rex, and Rick knows it well because he's been called out there on numerous occasions, and I thank him for that. And I'm about to call him again because as, this, as we uh, anticipate the spring, um, uh, we are seeing more and more um, rodents in downtown Brooklyn. Right. I mean, the one thing that I'll say is that hopefully that the cold – over the winter when we had nearly historic number of days in a row below 32, while miserable for us, usually keeps the rat population down. Um, and so hopefully there was a little bit less breeding occurring in the winter uh, than we've seen in the past when we've had uh, warmer winters recently. So that, that's a great segue, breeding. Uh, is there birth control for rodents? Uh, we do have a, a, a research arm of our pest control program. Um, there is one company that is promoting uh, a birth control. It's something we're, we're looking at. Um, there's not a lot of data that shows that it's effective right now. And dry ice, basically, from, one, from what Rick has um, informed me and educated me on, you basically put the dry ice in the burrow. You basically suffocate the rodent um, by the release of um, carbon monoxide is that how it Car works carbon dioxide carbon Correct. dioxide yep. and so the quick so is that dry ice only being offered in the designated zones um, if in fact you find uh, burrows uh, in and around uh, certain uh, areas in community in certain communities can you call the Department of Health and get dry ice so the, the dry ice isn't, isn't only for the mitigation zones, but it is a it is a we think of going to be a very effective tool, but it's only appropriate in certain places. So it's it's effective in parks. Um, we we can't we can't apply it within ten feet of a building mm -hmm. um, or an inhabited structure. So it's something to use in parks, and we work closely with the parks department to identify those parks that have. Uh, hawks or other birds of prey nesting there. It's operationally, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging tool to use um, for a number of reasons. So it's not that, uh, it's, Rick won't be able to put it anywhere. Right. Um, uh, but in places where it's appropriate, we think it's going to be very effective. Can it be used in our urban gardens? Uh, I, uh, I don't think we need it all around the building. We can use it in the backyard. As long as they're away from so the as long as uh, I'm not sure that we're going to be using it in, in gardens, and it may depend on exactly where that garden is. But I will say that we work very closely with the urban garden associations. Right. Um, we have very good um, relationships with them. We provide a lot of technical assistance to the, the gardening organizations and also to the gardeners themselves. As you note, yep. um, having a community garden can be a place for yeah. rats, yes. um, but there are steps that gardeners can take to mitigate that. And is there a specific rat academy for urban gardeners? We do have specific programs for urban gardeners. Okay. Um, with respect to the, uh, the trash uh, containers, um, in the designated areas, you're replacing them with steel cans. The compost containers, are they rat um, rodent proof? Right. The, the organic containers that we have provided in the curbside program are rodent resistant. The brown yes, ones. The brown ones. Okay. They're much better than, I would say, your typical black bag. Yeah. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we are trying to move folks to uh, participate in the program in these areas because the more food we get out of that black bag and into a container, we think the cleaner it will be. And um, before I get into my legislation, there was a lot of discussion with respect to these mint garbage bags. Does mint basically uh, 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 pro um, uh, yeah, propel? Well, we don't advocate for any particular bag. It, not any particular bag, but... I have no idea what mint does. You have no idea what mint does. Has anyone studied mint at all? Uh, we don't have any evidence that, that those are effective. Okay. 
with respect to the legislation that I've proposed, um, I know that you have some concerns that, have, that has been expressed in your testimony. Are there certain types of alterations, such as foundation work, that have, uh, pronounced, that have a pronounced effect on rat mitigation? Um, so, I mean, I think that this will be a conversation we can have at more length with the Department of Buildings. Uh, but, so one of the things I'll say is I think that it's very broad, the way the legislation is written, and could be, you know, anything that would require a permit, like, you know, I want to, not foundation work, but I just want to do something within the building where there's no evidence that it, one, that there are rats there, or two, that it would cause a disturbance, because primarily in construction, it's when you're getting down into the foundation near the dirt. Um, and so that's talking about demolition. And so we think that a lot of it is covered in the current code, maybe not being implemented in a way that has been completely effective, but um, at least in your eyes. So I think that it's worth having a conversation so that we don't have the unintended consequence of I wanted to change out my closet and I had to put rat traps down and I don't have any rats. Uh, but make sure that we're getting at when there is major disturbances, such as Atlantic Yards or whatever they're calling it now, um, where the street was, the whole thing was a hole for years yep. and years and yep. years. Yep. Uh, and obviously, apparently, it had a population we did not see for quite a long time. But we saw it. <laughs> well, no, we saw it when it when it got when it got disturbed. It it, it made itself very very well known. Very well known. Um, and we definitely want to make sure we are dealing with any situation like that where you're c where there is a disturbance caused by construction uh, that could make it so that you're having rats that had not been disturbed for years and upsetting nests. That we want to definitely address. We just don't want to sort of cast it so broadly that we're capturing the person who's making like a not huge change in apartment that doesn't actually have a rodent problem uh, so can't be and isn't upsetting a foundation so I think that we're on the same page in terms of what the intent needs to be and I think it's just going to be a question of fine-tuning some of the language so that we make sure that it doesn't sort of end up having making everyone think we're more bureaucratic than we already are. And as we anticipate rezonings in the city of New York, is there any coordination in anticipation of, you know, alterations and demolitions and construction work in in design in uh, anticipated rezone areas? So these this I mean I think yours as well as most legislation is really primarily focused on the zones. But I think that anytime you're going to have a disturbance of a foundation, or where you're going to do digging. Uh, we need to be focused on that in terms of either an assessment has happened or there or there is extermi extermination happening. Thank you. We're we're going to get to um, a second round of questions um, before we get to the advocates uh, from council members. Just wanted to ask um, regarding the 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 trash receptacles, the big bellies. Um, whether those are working, whether you see them uh, as part of this plan, um, and whether or not we can expand them. Just really want to get, I guess we have enough time with them to know whether they're working and so if you like them or not. So they are most effective where they have a business improvement district in charge of them. Um, they are less effective when they can't get sort of the daily care uh, because, as we have discussed, we have the challenge of the iced coffee people who think they're a table um, and in certain areas there is a lot of artistic activity that happens on them or stickers um, so we have found that they are most effective where like a bid's gonna sort of say and take care of them at least once a day and make sure they didn't get run over by a car or anything like that they're expensive um, they are primarily good at places like uh, where we really, really want to see if we can contain everything. Are we seeing a huge difference? Um, do we really, are we going to get the metrics? We're going to be measuring everything. Uh, and if Council Member Chin comes in and says, you've solved everything, uh, you know, one, the health department will get like major gold stars. But, um, you know, then we would think about whether or not it, it's, we've seen its true effectiveness. Uh, so this is the first really broad deployment focused on its use as rodent mitigation. Uh, its primary selling point has been, oh, you won't have to collect as often because it compacts. 
we have not found that just given the number, this may be true in places where there are not as many pedestrians, there are just too many pedestrians in the city of New York to have that cost saving piece to it. Um, but I think this is the first time we're really looking at it to see whether or not as a rodent mitigation tool, it is very effective. There were some small studies at the Parks Department that showed that like one big belly, when they moved a big belly in instead of a wire basket, that there was some improvement. Uh, but this is the first really broad application. So my legislation is important. Um, I'm, 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 it's, it's good to hear that it's gonna be effective. Um, uh, it could be effective in getting the reporting. Um, we're gonna go through one more round and then get to the advocates. Um, Council Member Cabrera followed by Council Member Deutsch and I believe Council Member uh, Margaret Chin also asked some questions. So Council Member Cabrera. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, part of my life I lived in California and They have flying rats there by the way or rats that can climb. No way. Yes, they do. Really? Yes, I, I don't remember those when I was over there. I'm just telling you, that's what I that's what I read. Is that like Northern California or No, it was Southern California. Really? It was LA. They wow. had climbing rats. I wonder where they came from. Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> no, the Brooklyn rats don't climb as much. <laughs> so you know, one of the things I notice, um, and in other states, I lived in Virginia as well, uh, is just this culture where people don't throw garbage in the floor. Mm -hmm. How, what can we do uh, to change that culture? Because to be honest, it's just one of my biggest pet peeves, mm -hmm. um, having lived here uh, now for for three decades. Um, is the, are, are there TV commercials that we could do, social media outreach? Yeah, uh, I'm, I am completely on the same page with you. I do not understand and, and it literally is not about income. I was following in my little personal car behind uh, an Audi, like, I don't know, one of the fancy ones. And I watched the, the family, like, literally they must have all had ice cream. And like, they're driving through Brooklyn, they just throw it all out the window. Yes. Um, and you see that even when people are literally steps from a litter basket. Uh, they have to take five more steps and they would have been at the litter basket. Uh, I am very open. We have an ongoing social media campaign right now called Trash Talk, which is about littering, which we filmed actually at the West 4th Street basketball court. So it's trying to do the, inter uh, the interaction between basketball and, and littering. Um, sure. But I mean, it, it is, I am not exactly sure how to bend the curve here. It's very, very frustrating, but I would very much like to work with you in terms of trying to figure out some way to have people not just throw things on the floor. I don't understand it, uh, but I do watch people do it all the time. I'm wondering if we should start with young people. Uh, so we could start with that next generation. And mm -hmm. I had an experience with this a, co a few months ago. I saw a young person was just standing with another guy, and. He took his soda and just threw it to the floor. I mean, just bam. And I, I had to stop him. I said, hey, man, you know, the garbage can is just right there. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. And then he recognized me because I was, I was in his school. He goes, I'm so sorry. I said, man, this is our neighborhood. This, nobody, you know, no, nobody's going to take care of our neighborhood if we don't take care of our neighborhood. And maybe it's one by one, but maybe social media, I mm -hmm. think that's where people are spending four and a half hours of their time a day uh, and more with young people. So uh, less than TV and it's, it's relatively inexpensive uh, to boost a video and just started creating, I, I love the plain words, the trash talk, and mm -hmm. culturally relevant, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, more ideas like that. But in social media, I think that's where we need to start, uh, you know, tackling young people. We, we will definitely reach out to your office and, and have you work to work with us on pushing and boosting this particular message that we have. It's very, very frustrating. I mean, I, I do have to say, when you speak to little children, though, because I was giving an award for a poster contest on littering, um, and there were, I mean, it was a fifth grader who won, but there were preschoolers there. And the, I'm like, so I know you all are really good recyclers and you never litter. And they go, oh, no, but my mommy, <laughs> my mommy does. I mean, so it's across the board um, that we have this sort of cultural acceptance that 
you know, litter is okay, or somebody else is going to pick it up. Mm. You know, somebody else out there is in charge of picking it up. And so um, this is, if, if you can think of it, we have a, we have a campaign right now. We just had, haven't had a lot of funding to really promote it, but I'm, I would like to share it with you so that you, if you think it's like would work in your community. I would, um, love, I would love to see that okay. and engage the schools and to have a very close relationship with principals and, and start, you know, start there because kids, you know, they'll give that information just like we've done health drive, you know, eating, um, healthy habits drive that we do with kids and mm -hmm. that percolates up to the parents. I think the same thing that we could do here. I mean to ask you uh, also, what do you, I mean, it's kind of a weird question, but what do we do with the dead rats? You know, once you collect them, because that's a health issue, I would imagine. We, we, don't, we don't collect the dead rats. We, they, they will decompose. So if somebody were to call and say, hey, there is five rats. We, right we would collect them. Okay. Collect, we collect as we collect all dead animals on the public street. And, and then where do they here. go? Do we have like a pet cemetery? Or? Uh, it depends on whether or not they end up going right into the regular refuse and getting sent to a landfill. If it's a large animal, uh, then it go it is taken care of by the contractor um, to ensure its proper disposal. And how, uh, from the moment that you get a call uh, on 311, how long before... We're mm -hmm. usually pretty fast. I'd have to get you the exact time on our uh, service level. But what's the? Uh, it's, it would be you know you know usually it's a day maybe. Okay. Um, well. For a large animal, uh, most people don't call about dead rats. They you know if they see them, they'll put them in a black bag and. Okay. I take what's in the black bag. And my other question, last question, is in regards to uh, your good work and and trying to get rid of these rats, but as we know, they double in one month. And have you seen how many one couple can have in a year? It is unbelievable. <laughs> it's, uh, they took those biblical words, be fruitful, multiply, very little, so, uh, and, and maximize it. So I, I'm just curious as to how we, is this sustainable, what we're doing right now, in light of the fact that they could multiply so fast? Well, I mean, I think as, as Deputy Commissioner Schiff has testified, we've had people graduate out of rat reservoirs, you know, lose the designation. So you don't have to have rats if you can get it under control. They don't necessarily, like, you got to have a couple to start. Uh, so if we can get rid of and get it to a clean slate, then you got a pretty decent shot that there won't be any. Okay. But I think right this second it's going to take a – sustained effort and it's going to really take everyone's assistance uh and making sure that they're doing the right thing uh in terms of keeping food away from these little critters yeah i think it's going to go back to changing the culture thank you so much thank you all right and uh councilman cabrera during the budget hearing i'm looking to expand the marketing um, arm of the uh, department of sanitation and make sure that we could really start allowing them to to educate folks on exactly how to not litter um how to get to zero by 30 and so forth. So I hope that you, you become an advocate alongside. Uh, alongside. I'm already in. All right, I appreciate you. it. There you go, we got two. I'm gonna um, get in trouble with like the uh, new head of OMB. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll be, f well, it's all, co it's all culture. It, it, it really is. And when it comes to yeah. the rats, it's our fault. Like I wanna be perfect now. We wanna get rid of them and we're spending all this, all these resources and this money, but it's our inability to, to keep trash contained, our, um, to, to separate trash. Um, it, and it's a cleanliness issue, mm -hmm. and and it is litter. And mm -hmm. New York City, it, it's a it's it's a big deal. It's a big mm -hmm. issue. Um, so I just want to make sure that we don't, you know, it's not all the rats' fault. Um, we got to do our part too. Um, and, and now I'm gonna call on Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if you have the figures today, or I should wait till the budget hearing. But um, my first question is, what is the headcount of sanitation enforcement offices? Uh, um, in enforcement officers, I would have to get you the exact number. It's in the order of mm -hmm. like 250. 250, that's for the city, uh, the entire city. That's for the enforcement agents. We and also have sanitation police officers, and there's approximately 50, 55 of those. So but I can, I will definitely provide, because uh, I think you, they, you ask me this every year, yeah. the headcount numbers not only um, 
for the whole city, but I can also provide it for each of the boroughs. So what's the job of a sanitation enforcement, uh, and what is the job of a sanitation police? Officer? So um, a sanitation enforcement offer officer is primarily going to be enforcing the recycling uh, codes as well as the cleanliness code. So they're likely to be giving the tickets to when they are doing the commercial routing, when they go up and down avenues to make sure during those two-hour segments that people have uh, cleaned the 18 inches in front of their buildings. They also do that for residences. Um, and so those are the primary types of tickets that they would write. Uh, in addition, they can write uh, other tickets, though they tend not to write a lot of personal service tickets uh, because they don't have the ability to make you give them ID. Uh, on the other hand, sanitation police officers are, are police officers, they carry guns. Um, so they are primarily focused on things like the illegal dumping because those can end up being very confrontational situations where they're pulling over a vehicle um, and making a stop and making arrests of that nature. Uh, and so they're, they tend to be more focused on those sorts of issues while um, the enforcement agents are usually, there's usually about two per community board every day who are doing the um, sort of quality of life summonses. So, I mean, to what it seems like is that you have 250 opposed to uh, 55. So is, does that mean that the uh, most priority is for mixed recycling then and uh, is uh, commercial establishment enforcement then illegal dumping they're and littering? They're, they're two very different. Because you have, you have a, a lot fewer um, sanitation police officers. You have 55 opposed to 250. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, in the commercial districts, I have to be very blunt and honest that uh, we have an initiative in the city council. Each member receives $200,000 for, mm -hmm. for the initiative. So I put my entire initiative for sanitation mm -hmm. to uh, for extra corner wastebasket mm -hmm. pickups in commercial areas for 26 weeks. Mm -hmm. So once the 26 weeks runs out, the rest of the year, you have maybe two days a week, three days a week, some day, sometimes four days a week, um, corner wastebasket pickups in commercial areas. So this goes back to my previous thing when it comes to the budget, that um, we need to set a good example, because if I'm walking down Avenue U, let's say my mm -hmm. district, and I have something in my hand, and I see the corner wastebasket is overflowing, and I cannot even throw that can or wrapper into that corner wastebasket, what am I going to do with it, right? I'm not saying I would throw it on the floor, me personally, but people would just dump it and just, like, you know, put their hands down, just make believe that, uh, you know, then the can or that wrapper goes on the floor. So when, it, when a neighborhood's clean, uh, I think people tend to keep their neighborhood clean when they see that the corner wastebaskets are, are clean and empty when they see the streets together with enforcement on our commercial establishments. When you put everything together, I think we could have a cleaner city. But when one neglects, then everyone else neglects and just throws everything in the fl uh, on the floor. So we need to um, make sure, again, you know, to close that gap, to make sure that all our commercial areas throughout the city receive the seven days a week. Um, you know, I know Sheep said Bay Road, those corner waste baskets overflowing. And no matter how many times uh, I speak to store owners and they adopt a basket, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have all the stores adopting a basket, but you have those, um, those, those good business owners mm -hmm. that take it upon themselves to adopt a basket. But then you have the rest of Sheep said Bay Road, which is overflowing. And people just, you know, I, I'm cleaning my corner basket, but look at the next block. And then that trash gets blown into my block. So if we could get every commercial area throughout the city, those corner waste baskets picked up every single day and get our recycling and our trash and our res residential areas, you will see the difference on the people. Um, I think we'll, we could end up looking like California. Uh, I don't know about, hopefully we don't have those rats here in Brooklyn, but we could end up looking like, like anywhere out of, out of New York City. Uh, in addition to that, I have also found that, you know, it's a lot easier to target homeowners than to target someone who's dumping or throwing uh, illegal dumping in the corner wastebaskets. 
So a lot of, you know, a lot of my constituents in and around my district, they complain to me. They have mixed recycling. They try their best. Uh, it's a full-time job because I do it in my house. And my wife knows my job is the trash. I come home, first thing, I go to the trash. This way she has no gripes against me. And it's a full-time job. I have two large clear bags in my kitchen, one for recycling, one for paper. I make it as easy as possible for the sanitation workers and for myself. But then you have those residents who are getting summonses, right, because it's an easy summons, right? All you have to do is go in front of the house, see a wrapper there, and you just tape it to the door. And secondly, you have people that have fire hydrants in front of their homes. And you, there has to be a little sensitivity because what happens when you have a fire hydrant, you have people parking there 2 o'clock in the morning. Remember, we have also 60,000 Uber drivers in the city, so they stick around. Where do they park? At the hydrants. So I'm not blaming it on the Uber drivers. But you have people that um, go on dates. They park at hydrants. They have Burger King or some kosher food in their car. And where does it get dumped? It gets dumped right outside the car at the hydrant. Now, those homeowners or business owners next morning get ticketed because they have wrappers and everything else in front of their business or homes because they have a hydrant. So you need also that sensitivity because sometimes, you know, a person needs to go to work and they can't sit in front of the house with a, with a, uh, with a broom every single, you know, second of the day during the, the, during the rounding hours. You know, it's a catch-22. So I think there needs to be more uh, collaboration, more outreach to people and more sensitivity and, you know, not going after those easy summonses, those easy tickets where it's a recycling issue. Uh, I live near a school. Every morning I open my trash can. There is a half, uh, half a cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee or something in my trash, just going inside because I keep my trash easy for the sanitation workers um, to, you know, to, get, to get my trash. I keep it in front of my house. People just dump in stuff. You know, so every few weeks I have to clear out. I have a, a liner, a garbage bag liner, and so every few weeks I have to clear out because it starts smelling. You know, so when you have that mixed recycling because someone just throws something in, or even when you have children in the house and you can't watch them every second of the day. So they shouldn't be targeted by the mixed recycling. Let's target those who, those who dump under the train trestles or on the street. Let's target those who dump their household trash in the corner of commercial waste baskets. Let's go after those big people, not after those little people who work hard each and every day, who try to recycle, who do the, the best, and end up with a pink ticket on their door. So we need to you know, reevaluate of how these sums are issued. And I think it's very important, and I think it w will encourage more, because it doesn't encourage when someone gets a $25 ticket. It just gets them upset. Um, especially in, in my district, in my neighborhood, we have one of the cleanest in, the com in that community board. So, and then when people get those summonses, it's very frustrating. Thank you. Your, your enthusiasm is noted, uh, Councilman Patosh. We're excited about how the next four years are gonna go with you on the committee. Um, a lot of issues there packed into one. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be following up. Thank you for your concerns. We're going to have Councilmember Chin followed by Councilmember uh, by Public Advocate Tish Joseph. Thank you. I just want to follow up on the um, illegal dumping uh, because, like, in Chinatown, the, the Big Belly is great. I mean, we have it on many a busy corner and is working. But one of the uh, negative effects is that it actually attracts a lot more illegal dumping. Then you have people putting garbage right next to it. Um, we also have incident where people try to shove everything in and they can't get it all in there. Um, and there is a bit that's working uh, in the area and they're getting frustrated because it's like all of a sudden now people are, are putting illegal stuff there. And so I think it's, it's something that we want to work together with, um, you know, DSNY, just some public education, and include some tough enforcement. So the, the, it's actually not illegal dumping unless there's a car or some vehicle. It is improper disposal. 
Um, and that is actually one of the things we're trying to change in this legislation is to allow us to look into that bag and see whether or not there's anything identifying and be able to write the ticket to that identification. Because right now, if I don't see you do it, I can't write you the ticket. But isn't that, wait a minute, if that's already... No, no, that's only if it's put in the litter basket, not if it's oh. next to the litter basket. <laughs> So we're trying to fix that little problem that we're having. Um, but certainly, like, we try and make sure that we're being really clear. We've done uh, some outreach to the businesses in terms of making sure that they have a carter and are not using uh, the corner litter baskets for their commercial waste. Um, we also continue to do work with the bid, who I think has been extremely helpful around making sure that they're communicating to that entire community about what we're trying to accomplish. And I know that, yes, when you have the, when suddenly you have more bags sort of showing up on the corner, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, but one of the things we think in this package of bills would really help us is to be able to do better enforcement about the bag next to the big belly, which we currently can't write, or we have to see it to write it. Okay, I mean, I mean, it just, uh it's just something we have to really correct. But I agree with my colleague that we really need to do more public education campaign and outreach. Um, and starting, you know, I agree with Councilmember Cabrera, we gotta start with um, the youngsters, uh, the people in public school. Because I remember when I went to public school, you learned not to throw garbage on the street. Oh yes. Uh, and cross at the crosswalk. <laughs> so that is something that we really have to uh, educate and also create the atmosphere that is unacceptable to throw things on the floor and throw garbage on the street. So yeah. that we really have to uh, really work on that. And hopefully um, there is money um, in the sanitation budget to really do more of these public education campaigns. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Um, and Council Member, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Public Advocate Tish. James, you're gonna close us out, so okay. good questions, hopefully. Just quick. Um, as from the $32 million, do, do we have any exterminators that are currently on staff, either in DSNY or Department of Health? Uh, it's not, DSNY does not have exterminators, so. But the health department has exterminators. How many exterminators do you have, and what is, what is their function? I mean, I know their function, what is their purpose? Um, so I'll have to see if I have the number of, um, of exterminators with me. Uh, their function is we will do exterminations on um, public property and also do exterminations on private property where the private property owner is not complying with our order and then we bill that private property owner for the work. So do you, we have to get a court order against that property owner before the um, Department of Health can uh, come in and exterminate? It will, it will depend on, how, on whether we can gain access. And so in, in resident, on residential property, um, we would have to get a court order? We may. Or, okay, excellent. Um, uh, I uh, was an early supporter of the big belly um, trash cans, and I believe that we should uh, we should get rid of the waste uh, cans, waste containers in the city of New York, and we should provide more big belly um, cans in the city of New York. I think that will will greatly reduce our rodent population. But I do recall, and I don't know whether or not this has been resolved. There was an issue with um, OMV. Um, because uh, Big Belly was not considered an expense item. No, there, it's not capitally eligible. It's not. It is an expense item. It is an expense item. So every one of them is on the expense budget. And therefore, it was cost prohibitive for our council members um, because the expense budget allocated to each council member was limited, and therefore it limited the amount of money that you can spend on a Big Belly um, container. Um, can we resolve that so we can make it capital eligible so that more no. members? Why? Because it's not expensive enough be capitally eligible under uh, bond council's determination. There's many things if you'd like to take on capital eligibility that I would like to be capitally eligible that is currently not capitally eligible. So I think this is an issue that we should have with the administration uh, because I, um, I don't, you know, one attorney's interp interpretation is different from the next. And so clearly we need to have a discussion with bound council as to whether or not that item or any other item is capital eligible so that more members can appropriate funds from their budget uh, for big belly containers. We will not allow a big belly to be placed outside of a bid at this point. So Why is that? Because we cannot service them in the way that they need to be cared for. Because there's not enough sufficient 
um, collection? Because it's, it's not a question of collection. They really need to be looked at every single day mm. um, because they just, they end up attracting a lot of things on top of them. So it's not that the bag inside is even necessarily full because it'll tell you when it's full. Um, it's that it just collects things on the top and, and so you end up with a lot of litter that can blow around. But we are placing them in these, in these designated areas, correct? They are all under bid control. All under bid control within the designated areas? Within the designated areas. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but definitely go talk to Bond Council, because I well, I I have really tried to push back on that and have been highly unsuccessful. Well, I'm going to talk to Bond Council, but we're also going to talk to you and to others with respect to providing them outside of the, the uh, outside of bids, uh, because I believe that will go a long way in reducing uh, the rodent population here in the city of New York. Commissioner, can you speak to me a little bit about basketball and rodents? Because I don't understand that. So this, it was a, it was a, it's a short commercial. Yeah. At a basketball tr uh, that we filmed. So that was, the premise of it is talk trash in New York. So it's, it's someone trying uh, it's a kid making a bat. I mean, I can show you the video. It'll be probably easier. Um, it's like a kid making a basket and somebody else shooting uh, garbage toward a litter basket and missing and walking away and sort of shaming that person into, you know, doing the right thing. So is this a problem throughout the city of New York basketball players are littering? More no, 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 no. It's just <laughs> the basketball <laughs> players are not littering. Oh, okay. They're so, so it's just a theme of just like... It's a theme. It's a theme. I, I have to show you the video. It's not no, the it's okay. basketball players No, no, you, players made, you made mention of it, and I thought there was a correlation between basketball and litter, and I no, had to ask we're, the question because I didn't understand. The, the correlation that people think of litter baskets Got like it. basketball baskets. And Councilmember Deutsch also underscored or made my point, and that it has nothing to do with low income. Um, the fact is, is that individuals who uh, patronize Burger King, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Uber drivers, and who else did you mention? Um, and individuals on dates also litter. Um, and so it has nothing to do with income. And so let's oh, make sure no, that we, no, we, um, we don't believe that people anything. of that notion. No. And, and last but not least, um, I know you didn't want to uh, promote a particular product, and neither do I, um, but I was uh, inf informed that some, I was it told that mint somehow repels rodents. Um, and so my question is, I know you don't want to answer that question, but is there any other thing or product um, that we know of that repels rodents, I don't if not mint? Do you, do you mean in like in the trash can? Yes. I don't think we've identified. Let me, let me I don't think. If someone can get back to me. And I can tell you before I answer that. Yes. Uh, 30 total exterminators and 15 oh. in the reservoirs. But let me see if okay. we have any, I don't. Okay, no known repellent to rats. Got it. And um, the, we should also mention that a lot of the big bellies went to parks. Went to parks. Parks, and they're in parks managing them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, again, I think council members that have uh, the mitigation zones already um, through the pilot program um, can speak to the great work that's happening in these districts in relation to the reduction of rats. Um, what we're doing here in the city council is pushing legislation so that we can uh, get a, a, some type of standard across the board so that we can expand this to other districts where we think that there are issues um, with rats in the city of New York. And, I, and I'm really excited about being able to, to see the progress elsewhere and also be able to track that progress and thank all the council members that are, were here today and also all the sponsors of the legislation as well as my committee staff. Um, and again, Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner, thank you so much for being here and excited maybe in a year to get to catch up and see how we've done with the rats. Thank you. Um, this meeting is uh, adjourned.